Welcome into the Art Gibbs Sports Business Podcast. This is episode two, and we're going to be talking about Team Bianchi and the 2003 Tour de France. He won his first bike race at the age of nine in a pair of old street shoes on a rented bike. It took the fall of the Berlin Wall for his school to close, and he was perhaps the most talented cyclist of all time. Like so many of his generation, Janorik's story is complex, and in many ways tragic, but he was an electrifying powerhouse on the bike, and a gracious champion off. And no one will forget his exploits and the color Celeste. Partly because it was only once that he wore those colors of Bianchi and the Tour de France, and partly because it was arguably the greatest tour duel of all time. Here's the story of the makeshift team, the last-minute sponsorship to save a tour place, and a battle that will forever be etched in our memories. Bianchi is the oldest bike manufacturer in the world, still in operation today. Founded in Milan, Italy in 1885 by Edardo Bianchi, an orphan who began working at age 8, who eventually became a medical instrument maker. Bianchi was a tinkerer and an inventor, and the Bianchi company was a pioneer of, quote, new bikes, the first to use equal size wheels and pneumatic tires. For a time, Bianchi produced motorcycles and even cars through its partnership with Fiat and Pirelli called Auto Bianchi. This Auto Bianchi eventually sold to Fiat in 1969. Bianchi, the cycling company, was grounded in a racing tradition. Wanting to advance and perform in the races first and foremost, pushing technology forward in that realm and letting it trickle down to other models of their bikes and other areas of society. The Departamento Corsa, or racing department, pardon my Italian, was a fixture in the company from its first days. Founder Eduardo Bianchi always wanted to test the bikes in the races. The racing slash sponsorship pedigree started early on, when they sponsored Giovanni Tomasello on his way to victory in the Grand Prix de Paris in 1899. This would eventually become the Tour de France. Giano Tomaselli, who according to Mark Bailey's 2015 interview for The Cyclist, would become Bianchi's first official CEO, showing where racing stood in the company. In 1950, the legendary Fausto Coppi won the Paris-Roubaix he won the race by two and a half minutes, and the bike featured a camp derailleur and universal brakes, the first to be used at high-level racing. And perhaps one of the most demanding and iconic riders to race on Bianchi bikes was Marco Pantani, who won the Giro Tour double in 1998, where according to Ciro Mercante, Bianchi's head of R&D, Pantani had 30 different frames a year from them, all with different weights, different angles, etc., But in addition to its technology and racing prowess, and perhaps even more notable in some ways, is Bianchi's color. It's iconic. The bikes are painted with Celeste, a turquoise blue color. It's a beautiful color and it can't miss. The origin of the color is debated. Some say it is the color of the Milan sky, others the color of Queen Margarita of Savoy, for whom Bianchi made bicycles and taught to ride a bicycle, and others, and perhaps most interestingly, say that it was just simply a mixture of surplus military paint on hand. In any way, it was beautiful. By 1995, Jan Ulrich's talent had blossomed from the lower ranks of East German cycling to the top German cycling team, Team Telecom. This was Germany's premier pro cycling team with many great stars, Bianu Ries, Eric Zabel, etc., and at just 21 years old, in the same year as signing with Team Telecom, Ulrich won the National Time Trial Championship of Germany and placed well in some large, high-end pro races like the Tour de Suisse. Ulrich was held out of competing in the biggest and best bike race of the year that year, the Tour de France, because of his young age, although he personally thought he could compete. His team, his manager, thought he wasn't quite ready for that ultimate level of competition, but he himself wanted to compete. By 1996, however, as, as history would have it, he was more than ready to compete at this zenith of pro cycling. The 1996 tour offered the potential for a sixth straight victory for Big Mig Miguel in Durain, an all-time great Spaniard who had won the previous five Tour de France's. In the opening 9.4-kilometer prologue time trial, Ulrich finished 33 seconds back of winner Alex Zula. Miguel in Durain cracked on the first mountain stage, losing four minutes and setting himself well back in the overall classification. 
Ulrich hovered around the leaders throughout the tour. He rode very well in the mountains, although he wasn't riding off the front of the field, partly because his teammate, Bianu Reese, was and was leading the race. Ulrich entered the final time trial in second place, almost four minutes behind tour leader Reese. Over the next 39 and a half miles of the final time trial in Emilon, Ulrich, already talented, already a young phenom, wearing the white jersey for best young rider in the race and sitting second in the tour overall, already a name that would ring as a potential star of the future, maybe even as a winner of the Tour de France himself one day, showed a sharp and bright glimpse into what would become known as perhaps the greatest talent ever seen on a bike. Over those 39 and a half miles, Ulrich, just 22 years old, after working with and for Reese over the grueling 19 days of the biggest race in the world, at the end of that race, he mopped the floor with the field, gashing Reese's lead to a fraction of what it was before. Ulrich ended the tour one minute and 38 seconds behind Reese in second place overall, but well atop cycling's future. A place he would realize the following year. Ulrich and Team Telecom initially intended for Ulrich to work for Bianu Reese in the 1997 tour, which he did initially. But as the tour headed into the mountains and other contenders starting to atta- started to attack, including Richard Varonk, only Ulrich could follow the attacks, not Reese. Ulrich followed the attacks until he attacked himself on stage 10, putting a minute into Varonk and Pantani, two of the better climbers of the decade. As the first range of mountains the Pyrenees, subsided, the middle individual time trial loomed, and Ulrich would show his dominance once again. Over the 34 and a half miles or 55 kilometer stage 12 time trial, Ulrich put over three minutes into his closest competitor, Varonk, who finished second on the stage. Over the final week of the tour, Ulrich withstood multiple attacks throughout the Alps from perhaps the greatest climber to ever live, Marco Pantani limiting his losses in those stages. And then the final general classification test was the 39-kilometer time trial in Disneyland, Paris. Ulrich finished second on the stage, but extended his lead over all of the GC rivals. At 23, Ulrich became the first German to win the Tour and the fourth youngest Tour de France winner ever. It was thought at this point that Ulrich would surely win multiple Tours going forward. As it would play out, the second Tour de France victory would prove to be more elusive than most could anticipate. In the 1998 tour, Ulrich led throughout the early part of the race, but after losing nine minutes to Pantani on a rainy, wet stage 15, Ulrich couldn't make up the gap and was forced into second overall. Then, in 1999, a knee injury forced him out of the tour altogether. He sat and watched as a brash cancer survivor from Texas dominated the tour and won by seven and a half minutes. The following year, he would be back, but he would finish six minutes behind the Texan, most of that loss occurring in the mountains, as there was only one major individual time trial, perhaps Ulrich's strongest event. And Lance won the time trial, with Ulrich a mere 25 seconds behind, but proving to be much stronger there. 2001 was a similar story, Ulrich unable to match Armstrong in the mountains and falling just short in the time trials. Ulrich couldn't defeat Armstrong, although there was sportsmanship and massive respect shown between the two, In this 2001 edition of the Tour de France, Ulrich crashed, tumbling headfirst down a hill, bike and all, and Armstrong stopped and waited for him to return to his bike before riding on. Ulrich's 2002 was very bumpy. With a drunk driving incident and a positive test for amphetamines in his system, he was banned from racing for six months. His juggernaut German team telecom dropped him. Ulrich cited his inability to beat Lance Armstrong as a contributing factor to his depression and behavior in 2002. And so that was it. Dropped, unable to beat Armstrong, and really not too close. Never getting within five minutes of Armstrong and let go by his team. That's it. Seemingly the end for Ulrich's time at the sharp end of the peloton. Meanwhile, in Treviglio, at Bianchi's assembly factory and R&D headquarters, the employees were putting finishing touches on Team Coast's custom Bianchi bikes. In the 2003 season, Bianchi would be the bike sponsor for the Pro Tour Team Coast, providing them with their speed machines to ride on for that season. Throughout the history of pro cycling, Bianchi as a bike brand stood as a pillar, but so too did their Bianchi team. Their celeste-colored shirts and all. The first Bianchi team existed in 1899 
and the Bianchi team with Bianchi as a title sponsor existed with a few with only a few years here and there off from 1899 all the way to 1984. With the magnificent feats, five Giro wins, two Tour de France wins, a Perry roubaix win of Fausto Coppi in the late 40s and 50s taking place on this Bianchi team on a Bianchi bike with Bianchi across his chest, among many other great victories throughout the decades with different riders. But after 1984, Bianchi's involvement as a title sponsor faded away. The bikes were still there, and they were still good performers. But that's where their sponsorship involvement stayed in the modern era. Strong bikes, they were the bike sponsor for various teams throughout the Pro Tour. They were under Pantani as he flew up the climbs in the late 90s and early 2000s, but not across his chest and not in Celeste. And that was to be the plan again in 2003. They would be the bike sponsor for the small, as far as top-level teams go, Team Coast cycling team. But no cycling team of their own. And Jan Ulrich, talented, but coming off a suspension, lacked the luster of years past. And he had resigned to sign with Team Coast in January of 2003. So climb aboard his Bianchi bike he did in Team Coast colors. So midway through the 2003 season, as the racing season began to wear on, Team Coast, with sponsorship payment issues, teetered on the brink of insolvency. After a promising victory in an April one-day race in Cologne, Team Coast quit paying their riders. That led the team's license to being pulled by racing officials. No racing was allowed for four weeks, and several riders subsequently left the team. Things didn't look good. Bianchi decided, in an effort to give their bikes a chance to be in the Tour de France that year, they would jump in as title sponsor for the rest of that season as a stopgap, funding the team, paying the riders just for that short time. It could never have imagined the piece of modern era cycling history their famous Celeste colors were about to be a part of. So the 2003 tour came around and the Texan was chasing his fifth straight victory. And he was the overwhelming favorite to win and do so. His main rivals included Iban Mayo, Tyler Hamilton, Yoshiba Balaki, Haimar Zubeldia, Ivan Basso, and Jan Orwick. So let the race begin. The 2003 Tour began with a short four-mile prologue. Although at four miles and flat, the time gaps were not substantial, and it was more of an exhibition slash display of pecking order early on. It did, though, show that Ulrich had real form. He finished fourth overall, ahead of Lance's seventh place, and just two seconds off the lead. Although the gap between Ulrich and the Texan was only five seconds here, it was a good sign. Throughout the first week of flat stages, the gaps between the leaders remained substantially unchanged, as was usually the case in the first few days of a tour. The first separating of any kind took place during the team time trial, a stage Lance's U.S. Postal Service team finally won for the first time over the traditional powerhouse Anse. Team Bianchi was third, 43 seconds behind U.S. Postal. Just as a quick note here, for those if you're not familiar with cycling, the way the team time trial works is that the entire team gets the time of the fifth rider to cross the line. Following this stage four team time trial, the overall standings again generally stayed the same throughout the first few flat stages after this time trial. Although stage seven was the first taste of the mountains in this edition of the tour, the first major day of climbing in the mountains took place the following day on stage eight. It saw Iban Mayo attack on the final climb, win the stage, and Lance, after his team's victorious team time trial performance and coming in close to Mayo on the stage, taking the overall lead in the tour. But with the first major shakeup in the general classification occurring, there was a conspicuous absence from the front. Jan Ulrich finished outside the top 10 on this stage back in 13th place, slotting him in to 8th place overall in the tour. Perhaps the year off was a bit too much. The high placing in the short prologue and good showing in the team time trial, strong showings but not necessarily peak Ulrich of before, maybe top 10 would be all he was shooting for this year, and that wouldn't be that bad. The following day, stage 9 saw Lance's famous off-road excursion take place, behind Yoshiba Balaki's terrible crash where his tire hit hot melted tar on a fast descent, causing him to lose control directly in front of Lance. The crash shattered his hip, and Lance had a split second to either go directly over the top of him and probably split his own hip, or turn left and go off-roading on a road bike. He went left, and we as spectators got some of the most spectacular images of the tour to date. Lance rejoined the group after his off-roading only caused a small loss of time. 
In this stage, most of the big climbs occurred early, allowing the top eight contenders to regroup their losses from the earlier climbs and generally finish together. Ulrich finished rather anonymously within that group. Flat stages 10 and 11 and a rest day left the GC battle all but paused until the individual time trial, the race of truth as they say, on stage 12. It came as an unbearably hot day for the 47-kilometer course from Gailac to Camp de Couvert. Most expected Armstrong would win rather easily. But as the race got underway and the time checks started coming in, it became apparent that Lance was not going to win that day. And not only that he was not going to win the day, but that his old rival, Jan Ulrich, was setting a blistering pace of best times across the course. In an absolutely dominating performance, Jan Ulrich won the stage and took over a minute and a half out of Armstrong, who finished in second place, and over two minutes out of contender Alexander Vinokurov, and nearly three minutes out of Zubeldia and Hamilton. Ulrich rocketed up the general classification from sixth place to second place, just 34 seconds behind Lance Armstrong. Stage 13 was back in the mountains and saw an early breakaway go and gain all the way up to nine minutes, with Carlos Sastra being the only rider from that group able to stay away till the end. Behind that breakaway, the general classification battle unfolded. As the yellow jersey group turned to head up the final climb, with Lance's U.S. Postal team setting the pace at the front. It wasn't long before the attack started coming, thick and fast. Both Heimar Zubeldia and Alexander Vinokurov attacked, breaking up the group of GC leaders. As the attacks went off the front, Ulrich followed the wheels, but Lance could not. Ulrich eventually overpowered Zubeldia and Vinokurov, powering up the climb, and nearly caught Sastre. Ulrich finished second, Lance finished seven seconds behind Ulrich. Once Ulrich's second place time bonus for the stage was factored in, he was now just 15 seconds behind Lance in the general classification. On stage 14, Armstrong marked Ulrich closely and stayed on his wheel the entire stage, while Vino attacked off the front, gaining a little over 40 seconds on the pair, bringing himself in third place within 18 seconds of Lance, making a slim margin across the podium of the Tour de France. The final real climbing of the tour loomed ahead on stage 15. It was a mountainous stage with the final climb finishing up the 13-kilometer ascent of Luz Ardiden. Entering the climb as the only survivor of an early breakaway, rider Sivan Chavanel was a full five minutes in front of the yellow jersey group, which contained Armstrong, Ulrich, and the major challengers for the GC victory. Chavanel could surely taste a stage victory at this point. As the yellow jersey group powered on to the final climb, again led by U.S. Postal, it wasn't long before the fireworks started. With 10 kilometers to go, Iban Mayo attacked out of the GC group. Armstrong followed, Ulrich followed too. Soon Lance took over in the front of Mayo, and then bam, his handlebar got stuck in a musette bag of a spectator, twisting his handlebars uncontrollably and violently, and down he went immediately. Mayo was so close behind that he went down too, and nearly Ulrich as well, who was close behind Mayo. As the slim group of GC elites went up the road, past the crash, Hamilton, Ulrich, and company decided to slow a bit till Armstrong was back in the group. Shades of repayment for 2001. Armstrong powered up to the back of the group, and once he was back to the back of that group, the attack started again immediately from the front. Iban Mayo, Zubeldia, all began pushing off the front again. Lance matched the attacks blow for blow and then himself attacked. With one of the most legendary rides of his career, he caught Chavanel four kilometers from the finish, making up five minutes and nine kilometers of climbing. As he flew past him, he offered a sportsman tap on the butt and continued up the climb. Putting 40 seconds into Ulrich, Mayo, and Zubeldia, who finished together in a chasing group of three. It was a legendary performance on the final day of the mountains. Stage 16, 17, and 18 were for the sprinters, as they were mainly flat stages, leaving the GC generally unchanged, and the final rendezvous for the GC contenders to the penultimate Stage 19 individual time trial. Stage 19 was a 49-kilometer individual time trial from Pronik to Nantes. Armstrong entered the time trial with 65 seconds over Ulrich, the very same discipline where Ulrich had put a minute and 36 seconds into Lance just one week before. 
For the first time in a long time, on the penultimate stage of the tour, the overall victory was far from decided. This final time trial was a bit flatter than the first, potentially tilting the advantage a little more in Ulrich's favor. And unlike the blistering temperatures of stage 12, this stage saw rain and cooler temperatures. As they set out on their respective rides, Ulrich and Armstrong were going tit for tat, riding identical times through the intermediary checkpoints. The 65 seconds needed by Ulrich to eclipse Armstrong seemed like a big ask as they approached the midway point of the time trial. But even so, anything could happen. And it did. 32 and a half kilometers into the stage, Ulrich, while riding slowly around a roundabout, slipped and fell, sliding into the barriers. He got up quickly and began riding, but that fall, combined with riding equal times to Armstrong throughout the early part of the stage, was the end of the challenge for the top step on the podium, and the closest anyone would ever get to beating Armstrong in his era of tour-winning dominance. But Ulrich got everyone to the TV and on the edge of their seats for the final time trial of the Tour de France, the penultimate stage with a chance to beat Armstrong, and that's more than anyone had done before or would prove to do in years to come. And he did it in Celeste, the colors of bicycling's oldest brand. Thank you. We appreciate you listening. And again, this is early days. If you like the podcast, share with your friends, subscribe. Again, early on, that's a big piece, and that helps a lot. Thank you so much, and we'll talk to you next time.